Welcome back. I understand we now have 14 jurors. Are there matters that we need to take up on the record outside of the presence of the jury? Not from the state, no. Not from the state. All right. And I understand there'll be some uh, images and easels put up and counsel for the defense anytime you want to reposition in order to better see the uh, exhibits, feel free to do so. Thanks, Mr. And um, so as not to disrupt uh, Mr. Fawcett's um, presentation, I don't want to be in the eye of the jury. Um, I'm just looking maybe over by the other side of the jury box or something of that nature. So just I think in that little alcove there is, is fine. That's fine. Thank you. All right. Uh, let's go ahead and bring jurors, sir. back. I uh, hope you had a good weekend. I believe we are ready to ask of the state, are there, is there further evidence for the state? Yes, Your Honor. The state would call Dr. Lauren Scott. I do. Thank you. All right, Mr. Fawcett. Thank you. State your name for the court, please. Dr. Lauren Scott. Where do you work, Dr. Scott? I work at the Office of the Chief Medical Examiner in Raleigh. And what is your position there? I'm a forensic pathologist there. How long have you worked uh, at the Office of the Medical Examiner's Office? I did my final training year there in um, June 2012 to June 2013 and have been a full-fledged doctor there since July of 2013. Are you licensed to practice uh, medicine in North Carolina? I am. Please tell us uh, where and when you received your medical training. I received my medical degree from the University at Buffalo in 2008. I then went on to four years of pathology residency at Dartmouth in New Hampshire, completed that in 2012, and as I stated before, did my final year of training, a fellowship year in forensic pathology at the Office of the Chief Medical Examiner in Raleigh. Dr. Scott, do you have a specialty in medicine? Yes. What is that specialty? Forensic pathology. Please tell us what the practice of forensic pathology uh, involves? Pathology in general is the study of disease. Forensic pathology focuses on diseases of a traumatic nature. As a forensic pathologist, our main task is to determine the cause and manner of death in cases of sudden unexpected death and in cases where death is presumed to be due to homicide, suicide, or accidental means. We do this through various medical exams, primary of which is the autopsy examination. Are you board certified in pathology? I am. What does board certification in, as a pathologist involve? 
It involves taking an examination and passing that examination and also um, doing maintenance of certification, which involves keeping up with um, updates in the medical field and taking an additional examination every 10 years. Have you testified before as an expert in forensic pathology? I have. Do you know how many times? This would be the seventh time. May I approach the witness, Your Honor? Yes. Let me show you what's marked as State's Exhibit 59. Do you recognize State's Exhibit 59? Yes. What is State's Exhibit 59? That is my CV or resume. Okay. And is that consistent with your testimony of your educational or training certifications you just testified to? Yes. Your Honor, the state would move into evidence states exhibit 59 at this time. <clears throat> Any objection? No, Your Honor, no. It's allowed. Your Honor, at this time, the state would tender Dr. Warren Scott as an expert in forensic pathology. Any objection? No, Your Honor. Her testimony will be received as proffered. All right. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, so, your duties as a pathologist, again, tell us your duties as a pathologist in general. Our main duty is to determine cause and manner of death in cases of unexpected death. Um, and we do that primarily through the autopsy examination. Okay. How many autopsies have you uh, performed? About 650. Okay. Can you please describe to us what is typically done in an autopsy? Yes. So as with any medical examination, we begin um, with a history. In our case and in this particular case, the history involves a brief summary of how the decedent was found and if they received any medical therapy in the interim between when they received their injury and when they came to our office. We begin with an external examination of the body, documenting all physical characteristics and any injuries that are visible on the external body surfaces. We do this both through written diagrams and through photographs. Once the external features are documented, we then proceed to examine the internal body cavities, making incisions into the chest cavity, into the abdominal cavity, into the head, examining all of the organs as they sit within the body, and then removing all of the organs to further document any disease that's present in the organs and any internal injuries that are present. Sometimes additional tests are done after the autopsy, including studies on the blood to see if there are any drugs or alcohol in the system, or um, microscopic studies taking tiny pieces of some of the organs to look at them under the microscope. Once all of those additional studies are done, an autopsy report compiling all the findings is written. In our case, did you, Dr. Scott, perform an autopsy on 29-year-old Jameson Kirk Hahn? I did. When did you perform this autopsy? On April 24th of 2013. Okay. Um, can you please describe for us your major um, findings of Jameson Kirk Hahn's autopsy? Yes. I saw multiple sharp force injuries on her body, sharp force injuries being injuries that are caused by some instrument that has a sharp or cutting edge. There was a total of four stab wounds, stab wounds being defined as wounds that are deeper into the body surface than they are long on the outside surface. And there are also several incised wounds, incised wounds being sharp force injuries that are longer on the body surface and shallower into the body. Okay, I refer to my diagram to make sure I hit all of her injuries. So she had had some medical intervention prior to her body coming to the office of the chief medical examiner. She'd had a surgical incision down the center of her abdomen in the middle of that incision, I could see the edges of what were a stab wound. The stab wound had been cut through by a surgical incision. The surgical incision ran vertically, and the stab wound ran horizontally on her abdomen. On internal examination, that stab wound went into the abdominal cavity and caused injury to the liver. There was actually a wound track that went completely through the liver. There was also medical intervention on the right side of the chest. 
the chest cavity had been opened with a surgical incision. From my internal exam, seeing a wound track extending into the chest cavity, I determined that there had been a stab wound there. I could no longer see the edges of the stab wound on the side of the chest as the surgical intervention had cut directly through it. But into the chest cavity, I could see that there was a bloody wound track extending um, through the musculature of the right side of the chest. There had been a portion of her right lung removed surgically. I presume that the original um, wound track had gone through that portion of the lung that had been removed. And there was an artery that runs in between two of the ribs that had been severed by injury that had um, some surgical packing on it. When I removed the packing, I could see that that artery had been severed by this wound track that entered through her right chest. There was also a small stab wound to the right side of the eye. It had gone upwards into the musculature underneath the eye. There were several superficial cutting wounds on the front part of the chest, on the front part of the neck, the right side of the neck, sorry, I pointed to the wrong side. There were several cutting injuries to the neck itself. There was a cut across the back of the neck, extending to the left side of the neck, which had um, gone into the musculature. There was a second cutting injury just underneath that one on the back to left side of the neck. There was another cutting injury on the right side of the neck. And several superficial scratches or cutting injuries down on the lower left side of the neck. And the arms, all of her injuries, um, all of her sharp force injuries were to the left arm. There were two cuts on her left wrist. There were two cuts on the back of the left arm, one closer to the side of the pinky finger, one closer to the side of the thumb. The one that was closer to the side of the thumb had gone fairly deep into her arm and it had caused injury to an artery that run, runs in between the two bones in the forearm. Some of these injuries showed evidence that they had been um, sutured surgically. There was an additional shallow cutting injury on the top part of the inside of the left arm. And then there were several cutting injuries across the index, two middle fingers, and two cutting injuries on the thumb. I think I've hit them all now. Okay. During your autopsy, uh, Dr. Scott, did you take photographs of the various injuries on Ms. Hahn's body? I did. Can I approach the witness, Sean? Yes, sir. Let me show you what's been marked for identification purposes of State's Exhibit 61 through State's Exhibit 77 and ask you if you recognize State's Exhibit 61 through 77. Let me just look through them all. I do. Generally, what are states exhibit 61 and set through 77? They are photographs taken of Jameson Hahn during her autopsy procedure. Okay. Do these photographs actually depict Ms. Hahn's body as you viewed it uh, on April 24th, 2013? They do. Would these photographs, states exhibit 61 through 77, help you illustrate to the jury the I, the location and wound of the wounds that you identified? They would. And would they help you explain your testimony further? Yes. Your Honor, at this time, the state would move into evidence states as if it's 61 through 77. Any objection? They're allowed for illustrative purposes. Thank you, Your Honor. 
Dr. Scott, did you also um, illustrate the various uh, injuries and findings you made during the autopsy of Ms. Hahn? I did. Uh, how did you do that, please? I uh, listed the injuries on a on several body diagrams. That approach the witness, Your Honor? Yes. <clears throat> show you what is marked for identification purposes. States Exhibit 78, 79, and 80. I'm going to ask if you recognize this is State 78, 79, and 80. Do you recognize these three? Exhibits? I do. Okay. And what are States Exhibit 78, 79, and 80? They are body diagrams that I made during uh, Jameson Hahn's autopsy procedure depicting the location of her injuries. Okay. Did these help you illustrate your testimony to the jury, States Exhibit 78, 79, and 80? And they would. If not, this time the state would ask you to enter States Exhibit 78, 79, and 80 into evidence. Any objection? No. They are allowed for illustrative purposes. Judge, at this time, can the state publish these various exhibits and have the Dr. Scott, point out for Stand over near the uh, TV a little bit. Um, um, let me get to this one. It's not reflect on the TV, I'll tell you. If we could at this time um, publish uh, State's Exhibit 61 on the uh, TV. State's Exhibit 61, please, Dr. Scott. This is an identification image uh, we take at every autopsy, a close-up of the face for identification purposes, also displaying the unique autopsy number that we assign each case. Okay. And this, this is the number consistent with Jameson Hahn's autopsy? It is. All right. It, it, does the, Ms. Hahn appear bloated in, in the face here? She does. Oh, do you have an explanation for that? Likely uh, fluids that she received in the hospital as a combination of um, decreased metabolism due to her injuries. Okay. Thank you. Let's go to States Exhibit 62, please. And if you would, identify for us what is in States Exhibit 62 and then with the body diagrams and your findings in as much detail provide to us the uh, this injury. This is a stab wound to the right side of the eye. The stab wound penetrated into the musculature underneath the eye. In my body diagrams, that's located here. Okay. Uh, how about the um, a depth of wound and other notations you made specifically as to this injury, if you could take us through. Sure. So this wound had a depth of one eighth inches into the mus filter underneath the eye. Okay. And that is your, that's an actual stab wound? Yes, a stab wound. Okay. It's, we define it as a wound that is deeper into the body than it is long on the body surface. Okay. So 
Did you make any notations of the uh, wound trajectory? It was downward, right to left. Okay. Slightly back to front. And is this the sharp first injury A in your findings? Yes. Let me ask you to look at your uh, autopsy findings, starting with sharp force injury A. Uh, the wound trajectory is slightly... It's right to left, oh, it was slightly... Upward, sorry, I think I said downward before. Okay. Slightly upward. All right. Right to left. Thank you. Let's go to State's Exhibit 63, please. Can you tell us what's depicted in State's Exhibit 63? These depict two superficial cutting injuries going across the chest to the neck. On the body diagrams, they are shown here. You can also see several superficial cutting injuries on the right front of the neck. That area of bruising up on the right chest is where a line was inserted medically into one of her vessels. Okay. How many um, separate sharp force injuries are you identifying on her chest? There's two major ones and then several sharp force injuries on the right and left side of the neck, which I did not quantitate. Okay. Uh, what's the longest uh, length of either of these injuries you talked about? Uh, 6.5 inches okay. was the one that goes up this way. Thank you. Let's go to State's Exhibit 64, please. Can you tell us what State's Exhibit 64 is depicting? These are two slightly deeper cutting injuries on the back and left side of the neck. You can see the ear up in the top left of the picture to give you some orientation. So these are both cutting injuries. The longer, larger one extended from the left side of the neck over to the back of the neck and extended into the musculature of the back of the neck. The smaller one underneath it extended more superficially into the soft tissue of the neck. On the diagrams, I have them drawn kind of more on the left side. It's a bit difficult sometimes on these 2D diagrams to depict the full extent of the wound, but those do curve around to the back of the neck. Okay. Uh, that's two wounds on this uh, <coughs> State's Exhibit 64 on the TV. Is that what you're testifying to? Yes, if I could. Can you approach yeah. the TV and point out exactly what you're yeah. talking about? So this is the larger wound here. The smaller wound right underneath it. And at the edge of each wound, there's a superficial cutting edge, possibly from the tip of some sharp instrument dragging across the skin surface after it had penetrated more deeply into the body. All right. Let's go to State's Exhibit 65, please. Can you tell us what is depicted about state, in State's Exhibit 65 and the details of any injuries you noted? This is the back and right side of the neck. The right ear you can see up on the top right here. This is that same wound that we saw in the previous diagram, curving over from the left side of the neck to the back of the neck. And this is an additional cutting injury on the right back of the neck. So that additional injury is shown here on the diagram and that injury uh, penetrated into the soft tissue of the neck. Let's go to State's Exhibit 66, please. Can you tell us what we're looking at at State's Exhibit 66? Yes, this is uh, Jameson's chin here. 
So it's a view of this top left part of her neck, leaning somewhat downwards. These same two cutting injuries that we saw before are up here. The larger one that extends to the back of the neck and the shorter one that's on the left side of the neck just below it. There are also several very superficial cutting injuries here on the left front of the neck. And this is that long cutting injury that was described before that extends from the chest. Okay. Um, if you would on the TV, between the long cutting injury and the wounds on the back left neck, what were the in between there, you said there were some other shock force injuries? Yes, these are very small, superficial cutting injuries on the left side of the neck. All right, thank you. Let's go to States Exhibit 67, please. This is a close-up of the decedent's thumb. There are two separate wounds here one running down the thumb surface and one here horizontally towards the base of the thumb. These additional little marks on the side of it are from surgical sutures, so the actual injury itself is this long cutting injury here. Two separate cutting injuries yes. on the thumb, and this is the left thumb? Yes. Okay. Let's go to States Exhibit 68, please. These are the decedent's left index finger to ring finger. There are three cutting injuries across these three fingers. Thank you. Let's go to States Exhibit 69. <clears throat> This is the decedent's left wrist. There are two separate cutting injuries on the wrist, one oriented diagonally and one horizontally. Okay. Could you on the TV point out on the picture, these are two separate cutting injuries? Yes. Okay. This horizontal one and this diagonal one. Thank you. Let's go to States Exhibit 70, please. This is a cutting injury on the back side of the left arm, closer to the thumb. The thumb would be off in this direction, so the arm is twisted a bit in the picture. And this is a single cutting injury here. This extended fairly deeply into the arm in this direction down into the front of the forearm and this is the injury um, that caused laceration and penetration of the artery that runs between the two bones of the forearm. Again these little points at the edge of it are surgical suture marks. How significant of a shock force injury was this wound depicted in States Exhibit 70? It would have caused some bleeding since it did injure the artery that runs in between the two bones of the forearm. It wouldn't have caused enough bleeding by itself to result in death with uh, medical intervention, but would have contributed to her general overall blood loss. Let's go to State Exhibit 71, please. This is the opposite side of the back of the left forearm. You can see the two injuries on the front of the wrist and an additional injury here. Another cutting injury. Again, this one was also sutured surgically. And some bruising at the side of it. All right. Let's go to States Exhibit 72, please. This is the decedent's left back. You can see at the top of the picture the left back of the neck with the same wounds that we saw before. And we can now see the wounds that were on her back. There were a total of four sharp force injuries on the left back. Some of them have started to heal. 
one here, one here of healing, and we're likely uh, pretty superficial. This one was a little bit deeper, extending into the musculature of the left back. This was a stab wound, meaning that it was deeper into the body than it was long on the body surface, and that also penetrated into the musculature of the left back. All right, what's the depth of penetration as to the lower stab wound in her back and any um, trajectory observations you made? That was um, slightly downward, left to right, and it had a total depth of approximately one and three quarter inches extending into the musculature of the back. Look at a close up. Let's go to States Exhibit 73 of that. This is a closer image of that wound that was on the lower back in the diagram. It would be this wound here <clears throat> that extended into the musculature of the back. Let's go to States Exhibit 74, please. This is a close-up of the wound on the top of the left back. This central wound here. One that was on the top of the shoulder, and you can see the edge of the superficial healing one next to it here. States Exhibit 75. This is requires some orientation, so it's taken the side of the abdomen. You can see the belly button here. So this larger area that you see up at the top is the surgical incision that was made down the abdomen. At the edge of the surgical incision, you can see the remnants of a stab wound. So the surgical incision runs vertically down the abdomen, the stab wound runs more horizontally across it. And this was the stab wound that went into the abdominal cavity and completely through the decedent's liver. Let me, uh, is this sharp force injury designated M? Yes. On, the, on your exhibit? Yes, so yeah. on here, the longer part is the surgical incision and the little horizontal part is the actual stab wound. Okay, on States Exhibit 65 that we're looking at, um, as far as orientation, is the bottom part, is Ms. Hahn's head to the right of the TV, is this the left side of her body? That would be the left side, yes. Okay. Um, so, as before, the belly button is here, so the stab wound is just above the belly button. Okay, and, okay, and, and just... Her feet and her head, if you own the TV, if you could show us where her feet and her head would be. So her head would be up here right. and her feet would be down to the left. Okay. And the stab wound itself is right above the belly button, the remnants of, of the stab. Yes. Okay. If you would, in your, with your autopsy report, could you um, in detail uh, tell us the observations you made of sharp force injury M as to that stab wound, please? Yes. So the wound track for this stab wound um, traveled from the front to the back, slightly downwards, and left to right. It entered about midline and then veered off slightly rightwards to go through the decedent's liver. The total depth of the wound was approximately 2.5 inches. Thank you. Now let's look at States Exhibit 76. Now what, what are we looking at, States Exhibit 76, please? This is the opposite side of the wound on the abdomen. So taken from the right side view. So in this case, the head would be up there, the feet would be down here. The Belly button on the opposite side would be around there. This is the surgical incision. 
and this is the edge of the stab wound here. And in notation, associated injuries consisted of hemoperitoneum. What does that mean, please, as to this particular stab wound? Bleeding into the abdominal cavity. Okay. And this is the right side of her body. Her head would be on the left side of the TV, the feet on the right side of the TV. Is that right? Yes. Okay. And finally, let's go to States Exhibit 77. Blue screen at this point. It's dry. Some technical difficulties. Thank you. This is State's Exhibit 77. Um, if you would, uh, tell us what we're looking at, please. This is the right side of the body focusing on the chest cavity. The front of the body would be to the right side of the screen. The back of the body would be to the left side of the screen. Her head and would be where, daughter? Her head would be up here. Thank you. So we're looking at the right side of the body. This is a surgical incision that was made into the right chest cavity. Presumably from what I saw internally, there was a stab wound here that had been directly cut through by the surgical incision. I can't tell from what I have left exactly where along the surgical incision it would have lied because they extended it directly from wherever the stab wound was on the body surface. And the stab wound entered the right chest cavity presumably went through the right lung as when I received the body there was a portion of the right lung missing that had been removed surgically and then injured an artery that runs in between two of the ribs towards the back part of the body and that artery had been packed surgically when I removed the surgical packing I saw that the artery had been severed by this stab wound would you, is this sharp force injury in? Yes. On your, could you read for us all of your observations on your autopsy report for sharp force injury in, please? Yes. So this injury resulted in hemothorax, which is bleeding into the chest cavity. And the wound track traveled from the right to the left, slightly upwards into the chest cavity and did not deviate significantly from the front or from the back. It went almost straight into the body cavity. Do you have your autopsy report in front of you? Yes. Could you, let me direct you to shock force injury in that paragraph at the bottom. Yes. Would you read for us your findings in your paragraph? Yes. The exact location and shape of the stab wound on the skin surface is obscured by a surgical thoracotomy incision, which is just an incision on the chest cavity. I had the um, distance it was located from the top of the head and from the anterior midline. The um, wound track perforated through an intercostal space, so a space between two ribs. Which two, please? Did you make a notation in your autopsy? Yes. Could the, you tell us what you wrote then? The sixth and seventh ribs on the right side of the body. Okay. And then penetrated presumably through the right lower lobe of the lung, as this is the portion of the lung that was removed surgically. Then penetrated into the right posterior intercostal artery which is the artery that runs in between two ribs towards the back of the body, between the T4 and T5 vertebral bodies. What does that mean specifically? That the, uh, the then after the, 
the right lower lo lobe of the lung then penetrates the right posterior intercoastal artery between the T4 and T5 vertebral bodies. What does that mean exactly? The ribs meet up with the vertebrae in the back and in between each of the ribs runs an artery. So this stab wound damaged the artery that runs in between those two ribs near where the ribs meet up with the vertebrae in the back. Okay. What's the next sentence you have after verbal bodies? There's a recent... There is recent <clears throat> surgical packing of the arterial injury and recent partial resection of the right lower lobe of the lung. All right. And do we see some of the packaging in States Exhibit 77? There is surgical packaging stuffed into the chest. Okay. Continue, please, with your findings. <clears throat> The total depth of the stab wound is about 5.5 inches. Resultant injuries include right hemothorax, which is bleeding into the chest cavity. And in the anatomical position, the wound track travels from right to left, slightly upwards, and does not deviate significantly front or back. The residual track that I could see going into the chest is pretty far back on her body. So this is the back side of her body, and this is the front side. And the ribs curve around to the back, so it went almost straight back to the ribs and didn't deviate significantly from front to back in order to curve around and hit those ribs where they curve into the back and join into the vertebrae. Right. The total depth <clears throat> noted is 5.5 inches of the stab wound? Yes. Is that, from the, is that from the stab wound independent of any surgical intervention that was conducted later? Yes. Okay. Um, as near as I can make it, because again, I don't know exactly where on the body surface the stab wound originated from, but I can tell where it entered the chest. Okay. The uh, right hemothorax, blood in the chest cavity? Is that yes. What, would that cause someone to have difficulty breathing? It would. Thank you, we can take that photo down. Dr. Scott, based on your autopsy of Ms. Hahn, do you have an opinion as to the cause of her death? I do. What is that opinion? Multiple stab wounds. Thank you, Dr. Scott. Cross-examination? Yes, sure. Thank you. Good morning, Dr. Scott. Good morning. My name is Joseph Arbor. Uh, I'm an attorney. I'm going to ask you some questions about your work on this case and your testimony here this morning, okay? Okay. Uh, I have to ask, I reviewed your curriculum vitae in preparation of your testifying here. You've had a long, uh, sounds like a long interest in forensic work. I noticed that you volunteered at the Erie County Medical Center, Medical Examiner's Office actually, in 2001 till 2002, correct? Yes. That was prior to going to med school? Yes, that was when I was in undergraduate studies in college. Was Dr. Ruku still the head of the forensic unit at that time? No, he had left just before I got there. You were familiar with him? I had heard of him, yes. Oh, you never met him? I never met him personally, no. You used to like to tell everybody he was Edie Amin's personal physician. <laughs> you did work with a Dr. Pretorius? Yes. He was like a clinical supervisor for one of your things that you did, right? Yes. Is, that the, is he the guy at ECMC that does um, senior medicine? Yes. 
Um, are you from Buffalo? Originally, yes. You don't know me? No. Okay. Um, you mentioned that you are trained in uh, probably going to have to change pads as a forensic pathologist to determine the cause and manner of death, uh, particularly involving uh, homicides, suicides, and death by accidental means. Is that correct? Yes. Um, when you start an autopsy. You are provided with um, a little bit of information about, if, particularly if it involves a criminal event, uh, regarding the nature of the criminal event, correct? Yes, a little bit. Yeah, they don't give you a whole lot. It's not really essential. Well, let me rephrase that. Having some knowledge of the manner in which an event occurs gives you uh, perhaps some direction toward how you might conduct an autopsy. Would that be fair? Yes, in general, all autopsies follow the same basic pattern. Yeah, for example, I mean, if someone t telling you, you know, this is a shooting or something, you're going to look at it completely differently, correct? We'll perform the same general procedures. You still have to perform the same procedures, but the, the, the difference is you're looking for entry wounds of a bullet or some projectile that would have caused the death. Similarly, if someone's uh, hurt in an accident, um, for perhaps a vehicular accident, there could be, that would be worthwhile to know some, some small particulars of the event to help you uh, as you're evaluating the subject that you're being asked to examine, correct? Yes. Similarly here, you were given a, uh, a brief um, rundown of this case um, prior to, at some point, prior to conducting your uh, medical examination of uh, this subject, isn't that correct? Yes. In fact, you recall, you do a, uh, a written, handwritten narrative summary of the circumstances surrounding the death? Yes. Did you do one in this case? I did. Did you do that on May 31st of 2013? If you're referring to the report of investigation by medical examiner, I signed off on that on April 24th of 2013. May I approach the witness room? Yes. You have the, uh, your notes in your report in front of you? Yes. I see. Is that exhibit marked or? No. Or you're just operating off your notes? Yes. Then give me a moment, please. Okay.
Mayor Pro Tour, Chair. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, let me show you what I just marked as Defendant's Exhibit 9 for identification. If you could identify what that document is. Yes, this is the report of investigation by medical examiner. Did you fill that out? I did. Some of that information on that form is provided to you by um, perhaps the police agencies that uh, are involved in this investigation. Yes, it would have been either law enforcement or the CCBI agent who attended the autopsy. They told you the, um, you reported a time on your report uh, that the subject was found as being 1719 uh, on the day of April 22nd, 2013, correct? And that was the information that I was given, yes. Which would have been, that's 519 p.m., correct? Yes. Um, the time and, and date of death is April 24th at 1.52 in the morning. Yes. Let me show you what I also just marked as Defendant's Exhibit 10 for identification. Do you recognize that document? Yes, this is the uh, back page of the report of investigation by medical examiner. That's a handwritten narrative summary of the circumstances surrounding death, correct? Yes. Now, I saw a date on that. Is that the date of May 31st? Is that the date you authored it, or is that a date that uh, you signed off on it? Uh, neither. This autopsy was done when I was still in my final year of training, so that is the date that my supervising physician signed off on the report. So you were still under supervision at the time that you did that one? Yes. Okay. So that, that, do you recall, would you have written that contemporaneous with the time that you were doing the autopsy, which I believe you said was on the 24th of April, the same day that uh, the subject passed away, correct? Yes, yes. So from the front page of the report of investigation by medical examiner, I did complete uh, this document on the same day as the autopsy, April 24th. So that's your handwriting in the narrative, correct? Yes. Um, in... in in that narrative, and this is, would that have been written, I don't know, when do you do it? Do you do the form uh, after, do you do the, I know different um, pathologists do it different ways. Do you do the form after you've completed your autopsy or do you do it as you go? After I've completed the autopsy. All right, so you, you, you're filling in this form after you're done, essentially. Yes. With your medical examination. Yes. Okay. And at that time when you filled this document and you indicated that um, in that, that uh, the decedent was found with, mul to, with multiple stab wounds, correct? Yes. That's how she was uh, initially found by law enforcement, correct? Uh, by EMS, by Emergency Medical Services. And she was brought there by uh, Wake Med personnel and, and law enforcement as well, correct? Yes. To, to wake med. And you recall writing in the entry uh, of your narrative that uh, this subject and her husband were stabbed by a friend who was embezzling money from them. That is what I wrote based on information given to me by law enforcement. That's what they were telling you at the, at the time that you were doing this, correct? Yes. Of course, you have no direct knowledge of that. That's just based no. upon information that others are telling you. Yes. You, you went through a series of describing for us the wounds that this young woman sustained uh, as a result of um, uh, what appeared to be a large sharp uh, or a sharp object correct yes um, don't I don't recall if you were asked to give an opinion as to the um, any description of 
the specifics of what type of sharp object might have been used, but it would not be inconsistent, the cuts that you saw, with that of, say, a, a large chef's knife or kitchen knife. Would that be correct? They would be consistent with the knife, yes. You also uh, did not indicate and cannot indicate by your autopsy or by the information that was provided to you uh, the order in which these wounds were sustained by this particular subject. Isn't that correct? And that's correct. There's no way to tell order based on the autopsy examination. And because you don't know order, there's no way to know, because there are certain wounds that are more serious than others, correct? Yes. The, the one going to the back of the neck would be one of the more serious wounds, correct? The one on the back of the neck actually just extended to the musculature. The two most serious ones would have been the one in the abdomen and the one on the right side of the chest. Those because one penetrate because the abdomen penetrated the liver, correct? Yes. And um, the one that penetrated to the um, side. Yes. Went to the between the ribs, striking the artery, causing bleeding in the chest cavity, correct? Yes. Those would be two very serious wounds. Yes. Actually, the one to the back of the neck, though it looks bad, left alone probably would, would have been something that could have been surgically repaired, correct? Yes. All right. Had you been given any information regarding the subject's activities, physical activity, if any, subsequent to... Um, receiving these stab wounds? I had been given the information that she had been brought to Wake Med Hospital and had stayed there for about two days prior to um, passing away. With respect to the question that I'm asking is that you be given any information as to what, if anything, uh, this subject would have physically done herself subsequent to sustaining these injuries prior to being brought to the hospital by emergency personnel? I was given information that when emergency personnel initially arrived on scene that she was um, responsive and complaining of difficulty breathing and subsequently became unresponsive. Beyond that, you don't know anything else? No. Though we just discussed, there are um, three rather bad, um, three injuries that appear very bad. Two of those three were the more serious medically to this subject, correct? Yes. But, it, but all would be fair to say that part of what caused or brought about um, this young woman's death was uh, in addition to the injuries, the, lo the loss of blood as well? Yes. And um, there are, as you just described, multiple injuries to this young woman, correct? Correct. They are somewhat random in nature, extending along the upper torso, uh, predominantly from about the waist up to the head area, correct? Yes. Um, they're random in nature, correct? From what I could see, most of them were focused on the left side of the body. Um, there weren't any on the right arm. They were all left arm. That's with respect to the arm. Yes. There were injuries sustained to this young woman's back. Yes. There are injuries sustained to the young woman's front. Yes. There are injuries sustained to the left arm, but there are injuries... Um, on the right chest. On the right side. 
all to varying degrees of severity. Agree? Yes. Because of the randomness, because of the varying degrees of severity uh, um, of the wounds, there's no way to, and because, and, and when you say cause of death, the cause of death, multiple stab wounds, it's not just any one of these wounds, it's the combined effect of all of these wounds that brought about this young woman's death, correct? Yes. As a result of that, uh, it would be, uh, you cannot say from an examination of this, you know, of this um, subject what happened with regard to the order of the injuries, correct? Correct. And you certainly cannot render any opinion as to what precipitated these events. You just made a notation in your report of what had been reported to you by the police agencies that were uh, requesting the autopsy, correct? Correct. If I could just have a moment. Sure. <clears throat> Redirect, Mr. Foster. No, no, Your Honor. All right, thank you, ma'am. You may step down. Do we have the next witness available? Not, we, not as we to, it told you. All right. And are we, 12 o'clock is the? 11.30. All right. So ladies and gentlemen, um, we have a scheduling issue. So we're going to go ahead and break till 11.30. Uh, and it's, I think, anticipated that the next witness will be available at that time. Uh, so we'll just be in recess until then. If you'll recall all of the instructions I've given you, please don't talk among yourselves or with anyone else about the case. Don't form or express opinions about the outcome of the case. No media or independent investigation into these matters. And please have no conversations or communications with parties, witnesses, or lawyers. If you'll gather in the deliberation room at 11.30, that's about 30 minutes from now. Please leave your notepads in your chairs. <coughs> if everyone else will remain seated. Anything we need to take up before we recess? Not for the state, no. All right, we'll be in recess till 1130. Sure, we'll say recess at 1130.